Hello viewers good day to all of you this is dr bk for you with another topic and a very important topic that is the shoulder joint now under the shoulder joint i will be discussing about mainly on the type of the shoulder joint it belongs to which type or variety of the joint the bones taking part in the shoulder joint that is the main parts of the bone they are called as the articulating surfaces followed by the ligaments what are all the ligaments which actually provide support to the shoulder joint followed by supports of the joint apart from the ligaments whether any other structures such as the muscles which lend support to the shoulder joint relations of this joint or the structures present around this joint which forms the relations and blood supply and very importantly nerve supply to this joint movements so what are all the movements possible in this joint and what are all the muscles which produce these movements of the joint also we will be discussing because any joint description is not complete without discussing the movements of the joint and finally we will discuss about the applied aspects of the shoulder joint now here you are able to see the diagram of the shoulder region where you can appreciate the humerus the head of the humerus you are able to see this is the head which is like a ball then in the upper part also you have the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle or greater tuberosity and greater tuberosity of the humerus this is called as the glenoid fossa of the scapula which is somewhat pear shaped and it also forms the socket this is like a bent finger that is your coracoid process behind you see the spine of the scapula with the acromion and the clavicle articulating with the acromion forming the acromioclavicular joint okay so basically the shoulder joint is a synovial joint which means the joint cavity or the interior of the capsule is lined by synovial membrane it is of ball and socket variety because the head of the humerus serves as a ball and the socket is served by the glenoid fossa of the scapula it is a polyaxial or a multiaxial joint so that means the joint can move in more than two directions in one direction it is called as uniaxial in other direction two directions it is called as biaxial so more than two directions so that is why it is a polyaxial or a multiaxial joint so repeatedly i am stressing that our shoulder joint has got a great degree and range of mobility so here you are looking the articulating surfaces of the shoulder joint so mainly the proximal or the medial articulating surface is formed by the glenoid fossa of the scapula so this is actually called as the glenoid fossa it is not a very deep fossa or does not form a perfect socket for the head of the humerus it is a very shallow fossa which is pear shaped okay and the distal or the lateral you have the head of the humerus which forms the ball for the socket if you look at the head of the humerus it is three times larger than the glenoid fossa so the head or a sphere it forms 3/4 of a sphere and the head is directed medially backwards and upwards so the head is directed medially backwards and 
upwards it is three times larger so naturally it does not completely fit so this itself can give you an idea about the stability of the joint it is not a very stable joint not congruently fit to each other both the articulating surfaces so you might wonder why actually it is so now if it is completely fit or it is going to fit if you, the socket is going to be very deep like a cup the real cup where this ball can go and fit inside the naturally what happens is the joint will be very stable joint as expected but the movements the degree and the range of the movement has to be compromised okay so here actually mobility at the cost of stability so very simply to tell you gain something you have to lose something okay so that is about the articulating surfaces the articulating surfaces are actually covered by the articular cartilage which is the hyaline cartilage so it covers the glenoid fossa and it also covers the head of the humerus up till this part which is the anatomical neck of the humerus okay so the articulating cartilage is the hyaline cartilage which covers both the articulating surface now if you look at the margins of this glenoid fossa one more rim of fibro cartilage is attached to it that is actually called as the glenoid labrum now here in this picture some tear is shown so don't worry about the tear and all i just want to see how actually the glenoid labrum is attached to the periphery of the glenoid fossa now this to some extent what happens is increases the depth of the glenoid fossa so thereby little bit of stability is gained through this way okay so that is actually what happens is the glenoid labrum so above what happens is the supraglenoid tubercle is present whereas the infraglenoid tubercle is present outside the glenoid labrum okay supraglenoid tubercle is present within the glenoid labrum infraglenoid tubercle is present outside the glenoid labrum now coming to the ligaments of any joint you have a capsule so the capsule forms or serves as a support for the joint it not only provides a covering but also a support then the other ligaments are the gleno humeral ligament coraco humeral ligament transverse humeral ligament glenoid labrum and coraco acromial ligament so these ligaments we are going to see the attachments of these ligaments one by one so first we are going to actually deal with the capsule so here what you see here is the capsule of course the part of the capsule has been removed for you to see the lateral articulating surface so laterally where actually it is attached to the anatomical neck of the humerus so here around the rim or the margins of the anatomical neck of the humerus what happens is the capsule is attached but when you look carefully inferiorly if you look it is not attached to the um, anatomical neck but it just dips 1 cm below so up to 1 cm what happens it extends below the capsule because the joint is weak inferiorly and not supported by any other structures the only support is the uh, the capsule which extends below and furthermore to some extent the long head of triceps also come into action we will see that later and of course on the inferior aspect when one structure is very intimately related near to the capsule that is the axillary nerve okay so medially where actually it is attached to the glenoid fossa outside the glenoid labrum okay so medially it is attached to the margins of the glenoid fossa external to the glenoid labrum so glenoid labrum is inside the capsule or intra capsular 
and one more thing you are able to see here the since the supraglenoid tubercle is inside the capsule the long head of biceps is present inside the joint cavity okay but whereas the long head of triceps is not present so only the biceps is actually present inside the joint cavity now the interior of the capsule will be lined by <coughs> a glistening shiny membrane which is actually called as the synovial membrane the synovial membrane not only lines the interior of the capsule it is also reflecting on to the humerus up to the anatomical neck beyond that it won't go and reflect on to the anatomical neck because anatomical neck takes part in articulation and it is covered by articular cartilage usually synovial membrane does not line the articular surfaces it lines the interior of the capsule and also reflects onto any other intracapsular structures in our case the intracapsular structure which is traveling inside is the long head of biceps so the long head of biceps also has its own covering of synovial sheath so this synovial membrane is going to secrete synovial fluid you all know that synovial fluid is essential for the lubrication of the joint and not only for that it is through the synovial membrane the nutrients diffuse to the articular cartilage so articular cartilage receives its nutrition from the synovial fluid as there is no blood vessels inside the joint cavity so you all know that any joint cavity there will not be any blood vessels because if the blood vessels are there during any articulation of the joint those blood vessels might get trapped they might get compressed ruptured bleeding also might take place so that is why the intra capsular structures are mainly nourished by the synovial fluid which is secreted by the synovial membrane the capsule also has some openings majorly two openings you can see so that it communicates because of this opening inside the joint cavity will communicate outside one for the opening of the tendon of long head of biceps so the long head of biceps naturally has to come out so it will create a opening in the capsule then one more is you have a bursa here the subacromial bursa sorry the subscapular bursa not the subacromial bursa so the subscapular bursa also communicates with the joint so there are two openings one for the opening of the tendon of the biceps and other one for the subscapular bursa occasionally sometimes not always the joint cavity might also communicate with the infraspinatus bursa so we will see the what are all the bursa present around the joint that is the shoulder joint after a few slides so these two what happens is the joint cavity communicates and these are the openings in the capsule so next we have seen about the capsule now we are coming to the ligaments the first ligament what you see here is the glino humeral ligament they are nothing but the thickenings of the capsule so the capsule is thickened at certain places to form the ligament which is called as the superior glino humeral middle glino humeral and inferior glino humeral ligament okay so three number superior middle and inferior glino humeral ligament it extends from the anterior margin of the glenoid fossa to the anatomical neck of the humerus so very naturally it is just uh, an extension or it is extending between the attachments of the capsule because these three ligaments itself are nothing but the thickenings of the capsule so naturally they extend among or along the attachment of the capsule that is margins of the glenoid fossa to the anatomical neck of humerus so the next ligament what we are going to see here is the coracohumeral ligament 
so this is actually called as the corocohumeral ligament from the corocoid process to the greater tubercle of the humerus from the corocoid process to the greater tubercle of the humerus you see the coracohumeral ligament then this is the transverse humeral ligament which extends from the greater tubercle to the lesser tubercle of humerus thereby converting the bicipital groove into a tunnel so the bicipital groove is actually converted into a tunnel by the transverse humeral ligament now why you might uh, wonder what is the use of this transverse humeral ligament while it is quite evident it is not supporting the shoulder joint in any way because it is away from the joint capsule somewhere near the greater and lesser tubercle one thing is so i told you that it is creating a tunnel for the passage of the tendon of biceps if at all this ligament is not present then the tendon of biceps might bow out or it might bend during various movements or come out of the intertubercular sulcus to prevent this the transverse humeral ligament is present <clears throat> same way what happens is the coracohumeral ligament also serves as a support to the joint on the superior aspect it is preventing the upper dislocation or upward dislocation of the shoulder joint so in this in this tunnel what all passes is the tendon of biceps with the synovial sheath covering it and ascending branch of anterior circumflex humeral artery so these are the contents of the bicipital groove if at all somebody asks then naturally you can tell that the contents of the bicipital groove or intertubercular sulcus is the tendon of biceps with the synovial sheath and the anterior circumflex humeral artery branch ascending branch next we are going to see another very important is structure which is going to render support to the shoulder joint is the coracoacromial arch so this whole arch like structure is mainly formed by the coracoid process the coracoacromial ligament and the acromion process so coracoid process coracoacromial ligament followed by the acromion process these three put together form the coracoacromial arch the coracoacromial arch serves as the secondary socket for the joint itself so like a secondary covering the coracoacromial arch the ligament is somewhat triangular where the base is attached to the lateral border of the coracoid process and the apex is attached to the acromion process very strong ligament the arch itself is very strong so any thrust or force given inferiorly what happens is the shoulder has to move above and it might get dislocated but that is actually prevented by the coracoacromial ligament and the arch so it prevents upward dislocation if at all the upward dislocation of the shoulder joint to occur the clavicle should get fractured only if the clavicular fracture takes place then first this has to take place only then the ligament might give away and what happens is the shoulder joint might get dislocated superiorly so this is most unlikely to happen so as i told you it serves as a secondary socket for the <coughs> joint next structure which is going to support the joint so far we have seen the capsule superior middle and inferior glenohumeral ligament we have seen about the coracohumeral ligament then we have seen about the transverse humeral ligament then we have seen about the coracoacromial arch that is the two bones with the coracoacromial ligament now we will see something called as the rotator cuff or it is also called as the musculo tendinous cuff the four muscles anteriorly only one muscle subscapularis 
which comes and gets itself inserted into the lesser tubercle of humerus what gets inserted into the greater tubercle of humerus sit muscle sit supraspinatus infraspinatus and teres minor now as the tendons of these three muscles when they go and insert into the lesser tubercle what happens is they become flattened out and merge with each other these three tendons they merge and they form a cuff or covering like structure which is actually called as the musculotendinous cuff okay so and they also not only they not only merge these three tendons merge with each other but they also go and fuse or merge with the capsule okay so the muscles are supraspinatus above infraspinatus and teres minor behind and subscapularis front so by now you would have clearly understood that the shoulder joint is supported from above by the coracoacromial arch which is very strong and in the front again above and behind by the rotator cuff muscles but inferiorly there is no such support now you might wonder why actually there is no inferiorly there is no support so for which i will answer this question after a few slides so that is the rotator cuff muscles for you and a more closer view you are able to see the subscapularis supraspinatus tendon coming from above and here you are able to see one bursa which is below the arch and above the supraspinatus tendon so this rotator cuff actually serves the function of your ligament and strengthens the capsule on all aspects except the inferior aspect now we will come to the bursa around the joint you now you might wonder again why so many bursa are present around the joint because so many tendons they are coming and getting inserted around the upper end of the humerus so when they come and get inserted naturally during various actions the tendon might due to friction might get ruptured when they come in contact with the bone so to prevent that what happens is the bursa serves as a lubricating mechanism so what are the bursa which are present the largest bursa is behind the subscapularis tendon subscapular bursa this bursa not only it's a open bursa because it communicates through a opening in the capsule with the joint cavity then the second bursa which is actually not seen in the view is the infraspinatus bursa which is behind infraspinatus bursa other bursas you are able to see here the subdeltoid bursa subcoracoid bursa and more importantly the subacromial bursa so the subacromial bursa is actually present between the coracoacromial arch and below the supraspinatus tendon okay so this bursa may get inflamed so that inflammation of that bursa again i will deal in the applied anatomy section of this lecture the other bursa as i told you below the coracoid process you have the subcoracoid bursa and deep to the deltoid what you have is the subdeltoid bursa now coming to the relations of the shoulder joint we have finished with the ligaments of the shoulder joint now we are coming to the relations of the shoulder joint section when you take a just a sagittal section a lateral view of the joint you are able to see here so what are all the structures you are able to make out first bony structure this is the coracoid process of the scapula so this should be the <coughs> acromion process behind if at all you will be able to see the body of the scapula okay so outermost covering what you see here is the deltoid muscle which is going to cover the joint anteriorly superiorly and posteriorly so deep to the deltoid subdeltoid structures we have already seen in the shoulder region so insertion of from the coracobrachialis from the coracoid process pectoralis minor might come then immediately above the shoulder joint 
deep to the acromion supraspinatus tendon separating it from the acromion process is the subacromial bursa subacromial bursa when this is supraspinatus and naturally from the posterior aspect of the scapula you have the infraspinatus lower border along the lateral border of the scapula what comes is the teres minor and more downwards you go teres major infraglenoid tubercle so naturally what you see here is the teres uh, major and long head of triceps long head of triceps tendon of long head of biceps is seen inside or within the capsule and inferiorly what you come across long head of triceps and posterior circumflex artery from the axillary artery and you also come across the axillary nerve which is from the posterior cord of brachial plexus so as i told you deltoid covers the joint anteriorly superiorly and posteriorly inferiorly you have the long head of triceps axillary nerve from the posterior cord and posterior circumflex vessels from the third part of axillary artery so again this is actually a three dimensional view showing the relations of the shoulder joint so you are able to see so what is this the deltoid muscle posteriorly also you see the deltoid muscle and the acromion process subacromial bursa tendon of supraspinatus here posteriorly infraspinatus teres minor you come across teres major here <coughs> subscapularis immediately in front and you also have a bursa here subscapular bursa this is coracoid process so pectoralis minor should get inserted here okay so most of the structures around this forms the relation for the shoulder joint now coming to the blood supply and nerve supply of the joint the arterial supply is mainly by the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral vessels so both these arteries they wind around the surgical neck of the humerus anastomose with each other and through their branches especially the ascending branches they supply the shoulder joint <laughs> apart from that the shoulder joint also receives blood supply from the circumflex scapular artery so circumflex scapular artery all taking part in the anastomosis around the body of the scapula circumflex scapular artery same way suprascapular artery okay so the suprascapular artery the circumflex scapular artery and the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral uh, vessels all these gives articular branches to the shoulder joint nerve supply is mainly by the lateral pectoral nerve so the lateral pectoral nerve actually will be emerging here after piercing the clavipectoral fascia so you remember the four structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia of which one structure is the lateral pectoral nerve so the lateral pectoral nerve supplies the shoulder joint the suprascapular nerve which is also going to supply the shoulder joint so it will pass above the scapula in the suprascapular notch through that it will pass it will give an articular branch and definitely the other one the very nerve which is closely related to the surgical neck of the humerus so that is also going to give an articular branch to the shoulder joint so axillary nerve suprascapular nerve and lateral pectoral nerve these three nerves supply the shoulder joint now we are actually coming to the most important part of this uh, lecture the movements of the shoulder joint so i already told you that the movements in re with respect to the shoulder joint is polyaxial so that means three axis more than two axis it takes place flexion and extension first so here you are able to see the flexion and extension when your hand you when you stretch your arm 
or your full upper limb and when your hand moves medially that is called as flexion the opposite of it when your hand moves backwards and laterally it is called as extension so the flexion is mainly brought about by the pectoralis major muscle and the anterior fibers of the deltoid the extension in the same way is brought about by the posterior fibers of deltoid and the triceps muscle especially the long head of triceps now all muscles any movement they should occur in any plane so flexion and extension in one plane abduction and adduction in other plane and lateral and medial rotation in other plane now here these movements are referred not to a plane such as a sagittal plane or coronal plane or transverse plane but they are referred with respect to the scapula so flexion and extension occur on a plane perpendicular to the body of the scapula okay so that is the main thing which you have to keep in mind with respect to the shoulder joint so they are mainly with respect oriented how they orient these movements with respect to the scapula and not with any coronal plane or sagittal plane for that matter okay so flexion and extension these are the muscles anterior fibers of deltoid and pectoralis major extension is by posterior fibers of deltoid and long head of triceps okay the next action what you are able to see here is the abduction and adduction so abduction is mainly brought about by initiation of abduction initiation of abduction is brought about by the supraspinatus muscle that is the first 15 degrees the next 15 to 90 degrees is mainly brought about by the middle fibers of deltoid now the recent studies have proved that it is not actually uh, it is not actually uh, described earlier that 15 to 20 degrees is by supraspinatus initiation and followed by the deltoid taken over by the deltoid but abduction up to 90 degrees is by the combined action of supraspinatus and the deltoid muscle above 90 degrees it is by the scapular rotation that is by the contraction of trapezius and serratus anterior okay so i will come to this adduction is mainly by the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor sorry not the minor subscapularis pectoralis major subscapularis latissimus dorsi and gravity aids in adduction because the gravity itself facilitates the limb to fall back from the higher position okay abduction and adduction takes place parallel to the plane of the body of scapula while flexion and extension is perpendicular abduction and adduction takes place along the line of the body of the scapula okay now here we are going to see the medial rotation and lateral rotation so this is the medial rotation and this is the lateral rotation which you are able to see here so medial rotation will be brought about mainly by the subscapularis teres major pectoralis major anterior fibers of deltoid and latissimus dorsi so if you look at the teres major pectoralis major latissimus dorsi are all attached to the medial lip of the intertubercular sulcus lateral rotation is mainly brought about by the infraspinatus and teres minor which is attached to the lateral tubercle from behind and by the posterior fibers of the deltoid now look at the picture here the medial rotation and lateral rotation if you want to demonstrate or if you want to test whether the medial rotation and lateral rotation is taking place effectively it is best done in a semi flexed arm so when the arm is actually flexed not fully flexed then naturally both the forearm and arm will approximate with each other in a semi flexed the hand should move medially for medial rotation and the hand should move laterally for the lateral rotation 
because if you simply uh, allow the arm to hang by the side and if you ask to perform medial rotation and lateral rotation the patient might do so even and it when he is pronating or supinating your forearm it appears as if the humerus is rotating medially and lateral so the best way to test medial rotation and lateral rotation is in a semi flexed elbow and to try to find out your whether your arm moves medially or laterally circumduction is actually the combination of all the movements you are able to see here so the combination of all the movements is actually called as the circumduction if you look at the circumduction see it is somewhat like a cone where the base of the cone is formed by the distal part of your limb and the apex is actually lying near the proximal part of the humerus that is one thing now one more thing what i would like to tell with respect to the medial rotation and lateral rotation is that i was discussing that the other movements flexion extension adduction and abduction takes place and it is referred best with the position of the scapula or related to the whether it is parallel or perpendicular to the body of the scapula but medial and lateral rotation has to nothing to do with scapula because it is independently occurring in the humerus okay and circumduction is a combination of all this movement and here what happens is it is also an adjunct rotation not a conjunct rotation so in conjunct rotation what happens is no independent rotation will take place if you perform all the other actions it appears as if circumduction will take place combination of the movements but in adjunct rotation rotation can take place in an independent axis independent of the other movements like your flexion extension adduction abduction okay so now we have seen about the abduction up to the 90 degrees is actually brought about by the deltoid muscle or for that matter supraspinatus and the deltoid muscle now if you want to abduct more beyond 90 degrees overhead abduction that is beyond 90 up to 120 and then 180 180 degrees your hand will be raised above your head okay so in schools we raise our hand for something no when the teacher asks to raise your hand naturally this we do by overhead abduction now for the overhead abduction to occur what happens is first up to 90 degrees the whole head of the humerus is used up by the scapula so there is no further movement naturally what happens is lateral rotation of the humerus takes place and that is facilitated by the teres minor muscle and the infraspinatus so once lateral rotation takes place what happens is then overhead abduction takes place without that it is fully used up and the greater tuberosity of the humerus the greater tuberosity is impinging here thereby not allowing any further movement so slowly a little bit of lateral rotation takes place that is one thing second thing even the overhead abduction little bit of lateral rotation takes place this complete overhead abduction is achieved by the rotation of the scapula so this rotation of the scapula here you are able to see here is mainly achieved by the fibers of serratus anterior which is going to pull the scapula from the front and the trapezius muscle mainly the upper and the middle fibers of the trapezius what happens they will also contract thereby scapula is tilted or rotated so without this also this is not possible otherwise what happens there was going to be only inferior dislocation so this is called a scapulo humeral rhythm that is for a complete 120 degree of abduction 60 degrees is by the scapular rhythm so for every 2 degrees of humeral movement there is 1 degree of scapular rotation that is actually called as the scapulo humeral rhythm uh, that explanation is also given here 1 is to 2 ratio the scapulo humeral rhythm takes place okay 
that is for the overhead abduction now what are all the factors which are responsible for maintaining the stability of the joint we already i have mentioned that it is a greatly mobile joint but at the cost of stability but to some extent stability has to be achieved <laughs> mainly supraspinatus and coracohumeral they are actually exerting a great uh, suspension force from above thereby preventing the downward dislocation so from above they are holding the joint like a suspension thereby it prevents the inferior or downward dislocation of the joint rotator cuff strengthens the capsule it acts more like a ligament rather than any covering glenoid labrum what happens is the glenoid labrum deepens the cup the glenoid fossa thereby also contributes for the stability of the joint and coracoacromial arch that i have discussed well it prevents the superior dislocation and acts as a secondary socket for the joint so these are the factors which are mainly responsible for maintaining the stability of the shoulder joint the only support which is rendered to the capsule is a weak support by the long head of triceps below the capsule other than that there is no protection for the capsule on the inferior aspect so that is why the capsule itself extends little bit up till the surgical neck of the humerus so next we are going to discuss about the applied aspects of the shoulder joint one by one so the first aspect will be the subacromial bursitis so we have already discussed about this subacromial bursa which is present below the coracoacromial arch now if this bursa is inflamed then naturally what happens is you will have pain while the arm is at rest or when you are not performing any shoulder joints because the bursa will be out of the acromial arch now when you abduct what happens is the pain disappears because the bursa escapes deep beneath the subacromial arch okay now what happens is apart from the subacromial bursitis or it might lead secondarily to the supraspinatus tendinitis or inflammation of the supraspinous tendon now in case of supraspinatus tendinitis there will be difficulty in initiating the abduction and not only that from 60 to 90 degrees of abduction what happens is or above that up to 180 degrees if you go there will be tremendous pain over the shoulder region because this supraspinatus tendon will go and impinge over this acromion process so the difference between the subacromial bursitis and the supraspinatus tendinitis is in the first case there will be pain when the arm is at rest in the second case that is in the case of supraspinatus tendinitis there will be pain when the arm actually starts abduction and especially as you increase the abduction mainly from the 90 degrees to the overhead abduction the tendon impinges over the acromion process so to overcome this and to perform abduction uh, what happens is the patient assumes a position which is called as the dobons sign so in case of the dobon sign what happens is the patient uh, with the affected shoulder on the affected side he will tilt his body or he will flex his trunk laterally and then suddenly what happens is from the flexed position he will try to uh, become erect so when actually what happens is when he tilts the arm goes downwards and when he becomes erect naturally the arm will come above because the weight of the trunk will pull the arm and in this way he will be performing the abduction the next is actually called as the painful arc syndrome so the painful arc syndrome is pain 
where all the pain is exp- uh, experienced mainly during the abduction most common in males and also people above 50 years of age because when they perform lot of actions when they use their shoulder too much so this is as i told you excessive use of the shoulder so mainly it is characterized by supraspinatus tendinitis or subacromial bursitis mainly what happens is between 45 degrees to 120 degrees there is pain is experienced during abduction in this region then up to 170 degrees no pain and beyond that what happens is overhead complete to complete the overhead abduction again there is pain so one thing is supraspinatus tendinitis is causing the pain in the first arc in this range then that is subacromial bursitis sorry it is not supraspinatus tendinitis subacromial bursitis initially then when the tendon is going to impinge over the acromion then between the last stages of the overhead abduction he will be feeling the pain this is actually called as the painful arc syndrome then axillary nerve might get damaged when during the antero inferior dislocation so the antero inferior dislocation is the most common type of shoulder dislocation because as we have already discussed that the shoulder joint is weak inferiorly so in this case during antero inferior dislocation if the axillary nerve is involved or damaged then paralysis of the deltoid muscle takes place so this is actually the normal anatomy and now you are able to see the antero inferior dislocation so antero inferior dislocation most commonly occurs when you try to throw something forcefully with the help of your hands so you are holding a ball a football or a basketball and when you want to throw it very forcefully so that it goes to a very longer distance then naturally what happens is antero inferior dislocation might take place this is one thing or sometimes when the glenoid labrum is damaged okay when the glenoid labrum is damaged and that is actually called as the bankart lesion so bankart lesion is the damage of this one so and when this antero inferior dislocation occurs very commonly again and again that is actually called as the recurrent dislocation of the shoulder okay it is actually called as the recurrent dislocation now the recurrent dislocation what happens is the patient reduces the dislocation by himself so again what happens by the shoulder movement if he adjusts it goes and fits there into the glenoid cavity but what happens is it will recur okay next is actually the frozen shoulder but before that posterior dislocations uh, even though it is not quite common might occur if there is a direct blow to the shoulder joint okay so if there is a direct blow due to any trauma or any what do you call somebody is inflicting any injury this might take place the next condition is the frozen shoulder what happens in the frozen shoulder is there is pain stiffness so you, you move your shoulder you will experience pain and the movement is very much restricted this is due to the rotator cuff getting fibrosed the capsule getting fibrosed and the deltoid muscle all those things what happens they get fibrosed including the subacromial bursa and adhesions takes place so they will get stick to one and each other so it will become completely dry and because of that what happens is uh, you will not be able to move your shoulder so movement restriction and stiffness of the shoulder takes place most common in periarthritis um, periarthritis and again diabetic people tend to suffer from periarthritis so because there is movement restriction disuse atrophy of the muscles so muscles what happens they become thin and weak wasting of the muscles takes place around the joint so finally uh, coming to the radiograph of the shoulder region because the description of the shoulder joint is not complete without the description of the radiology so here you are able to see a plain radiograph we call it as a radiograph plain radiograph because no contrast material is used and is the anteroposterior view 
So here you are able to see the head of the humerus. Then you are able to see the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle. So that should be your intertubercular sulcus. Acromion process, glenoid fossa. So this is actually the glenoid fossa articulating. See the size of the head and the size of the glenoid fossa. It is three times larger. Something which is projecting anteriorly is your coracoid process. And this is your acromion, lateral end of clavicle forming the acromioclavicular joint. Medial end of clavicle, this is the manibrium sternum forming the, so this is actually forming the sternoclavicular joint. See the first rib. So that is actually the first rib you are able to see here. And these are all the other ribs articulating. This black shadow is actually due to the lungs, air in the lungs. And all this haziness is the blood vessels which are entering into the lung. You are also able to make out the body of the scapula, medial border, inferior angle of the scapula. This is actually vertebral column. You are able to see the spines of the vertebral column. This is the head of the ribs articulating with the body and you see the neck articulating the transverse process. So here you are able to see the tubercle of the rib, especially the first rib articulating with the transverse process very beautifully. So, in this class, I have described about the type, ligaments, relations, blood supply, nerve supply and radiological images of the shoulder joint. So, thank you very much for patient listening and we will meet again in one more lecture.